Today, I will be discussing thyroid function tests. The learning objectives will be first, to be able to describe the general structure and function of the hormones involved in thyroid gland regulation. Second, to be able to diagram the relationship between the thyroid hormones. Next, to use thyroid function tests to diagnose the four general categories of thyroidal illness. And the last, to list non-thyroidal conditions which can affect TFTs. TFTs can be a confusing topic for a number of reasons. Their interpretation superficially seems like it should be incredibly easy, and for the majority of patients it is. However, a significant minority of TFTs don't conform to what logic suggests, for reasons I'll discuss. Also, the biosynthesis of thyroid hormone is unusually complex, but as most of the synthetic steps are of minimal clinical relevance, I'll be covering only the most important aspects. Finally, even the terminology surrounding TFTs is confusing. While the term thyroid hormone generally refers to one of two specific and nearly identical compounds, there are nevertheless a total of four hormones involved in the process. I'll briefly review each. The first is thyrotropin releasing hormone, or TRH. TRH is a tripeptide amide, which essentially means it's composed of three amino acids. It's formed in the hypothalamus and travels to the anterior pituitary via the hypothalamic hypophyseal portal system. The primary effect of TRH is to stimulate release in the pituitary of the next hormone in the pathway, TSH. Another effect of TRH which won't be discussed further in this particular video is to stimulate secretion of prolactin. Now TSH, known formally as thyroid stimulating hormone, as well as thyrotropin, is a glycoprotein. It has a number of different specific effects, all of which are focused on increasing the physiologic actions of thyroid hormone. These are to increase the release of preformed thyroid hormone, to increase the rate of thyroid hormone formation, and to increase the size and number of thyroid cells which produce that hormone. Next, let me talk about the true thyroid hormones that is, those hormones which are actually synthesized and released by the thyroid gland. They are almost universally called T3 and T4, though formally are triiodothyronine and thyroxine. As mentioned a minute ago, the biosynthesis of T3 and T4 is very complicated, but requires tyrosine and iodine. The tyrosine used for thyroid hormone is actually stored as a glycoprotein called thyroglobulin each molecule of which has about 70 molecules of tyrosine, and the thyroid hormone is actually synthesized while still attached to the larger thyroglobulin, and remains so until it is secreted. The thyroid gland is relatively unique among endocrine organs in its ability to store large amounts of preformed hormone. This can become relevant in diseases such as Hashimoto's thyroiditis, an autoimmune-mediated destruction of the thyroid gland, which can transiently result in hyperthyroidism due to abrupt release of hormone. In normal physiologic conditions, in response to TSH, the thyroid secretes predominantly T4 along with a small amount of T3. The ratio of T4 to T3 is about 90% to 10%. After they're released, over 99% of the thyroid hormones are bound to plasma proteins in the circulation. The predominant one is called thyroxine binding globulin, or TBG. Some is also bound to albumin, as well as a protein called transthyretin, so named because it's responsible for the transport of thyroxine and retinol. Only the tiny, free, unbound form of thyroid hormone is physiologically active. The effect of protein binding is clinically important because changes in the concentration of thyroxine binding globulin can affect the concentration of unbound hormone. For example, in steroid use and in cirrhosis, less of thyroxine binding globulin is produced, resulting in a higher proportion of free hormones. The opposite effect occurs during pregnancy, in which the liver produces higher than normal amounts of thyroxine binding globulin. Now, despite the fact that the thyroid secretes much more T4 than T3, the biological activity of T3 is much greater than T4. The peripheral tissues convert some of the relatively inactive T4 to the relatively active T3, 
as well as some to the completely inactive reverse T3, also known as RT3. In fact, some recommend considering T4 more of an inactive pro-hormone and T3 really the only th proper thyroid hormone. What do T3 and T4 do? They have the greatest diversity of actions of any hormone. Their primary effects are first, to increase the basal metabolic rate, which results in increased heat generation and oxygen consumption. Second, they sort of rev up metabolism, specifically increasing gluconeogenesis, glycolysis, glucose absorption from the GI tract, lipolysis, and protein turnover. Next, they stimulate bone maturation and growth. And their last major effect under normal physiologic conditions is to increase cardiac output by increasing both the heart rate and contractility. You may have noticed that many of the physiological effects of the thyroid hormones are similar to those from the activation of the sympathetic nervous system, and there may be interactions between the two which are not yet understood, explaining why beta blockers are a commonly employed a treatment for some manifestations of hyperthyroidism. I'll now move on to discuss how thyroid hormones are regulated, which will partly be a visual representation of what was just covered. It begins in the brain at the hypothalamus, where TRH is released into the hypophyseal portal system to be delivered directly to the anterior pituitary, where it stimulates TSH release. And TSH, released into the systemic circulation, travels to the thyroid, where it stimulates, among other things, the formation of predominantly T4 from thyroid globulin and iodine. T4 travels in the bloodstream, largely bound to thyroxine binding globulin, and when it reaches certain peripheral tissues, it's converted to T3 by an enzyme, or more accurately, a collection of very similar enzymes called diiodinases, which as their name implies, can add or remove an iodine atom from a molecule. There are actually a number of different names for these enzymes in medical textbooks and in the literature. One of the more common alternate names is 5' iodinase. Now, not all of the T4 gets converted to T3, as some also gets converted into the molecule reverse T3, which, as I said before, is inactive. Both active T3 and reverse T3 only differ in which of the four iodine atoms were removed by the enzyme. Normally, there's about a one-to-one -one ratio of T3 to reverse T3 that it's produced. However, pregnancy, fasting, hepatic and renal failure, and beta blockers all result in preferential conversion to reverse T3, thus decreasing the amount of active hormone. There are a number of important negative feedback mechanisms in this pathway. First, the thyroid hormones themselves exert negative feedback on the hypothalamus and pituitary, to reduce secretion of TRH and TSH respectively. So for example, if TSH starts to get too high, this leads to higher levels of T3 and T4, which leads to greater inhibition of TSH. Thus, the system can keep TSH and thyroid hormones within a specific window. In addition to hormonal negative feedback, there are a few others as well. For example, both physiologic and emotional stress can inhibit TRH and TSH, which is a likely contributor to the euthyroid 6 syndrome to be discussed in a few minutes. In addition, exposure to cold temperature appears to inhibit TRH, though the clinical significance of this in humans appears to be low. The final point to bring up with this diagram concerns the two possible effects of an acute iodine load on the actions of the thyroid. The first possible effect is called the wolf chaikoff effect, which is a reduction in thyroid hormone levels seen after an acute iodine load, which presumably evolved as a means to prevent hyperthyroidism in response to being suddenly provided a high amount of substrate. This effect explains both the hypothyroidism seen by some patients after starting the iodine-containing antirhythmic medication amiodarone, as well as the use of high-dose iodine after nuclear emergencies, as it will prevent uptake of radioactive iodine from the atmosphere. The second possible effect of an acute iodine load is called the yod bastau effect, which is stimulation of the thyroid gland's production of hormone. Unlike the wolf chaikoff effect, which can be seen in patients with completely normal thyroids, the yod bastau effect is only observed in patients with pre-existing thyroid pathology, 
A typical scenario occurs when the patient with a goiter and hypothyroidism from chronic iodine deficiency moves to an area where iodine is abundant in the diet. It can also be seen in patients with a multinodular goiter or Graves' disease who is started on amiodarone. If you feel confused by these two seemingly contradictory effects, don't worry, you're not alone. Luckily, with the exception of amiodarone use, these effects come up pretty uncommonly in routine clinical practice. Okay, well now I'm finally going to get to discuss what you've probably been waiting for, the actual thyroid function tests, or TFTs. TFTs are complicated due to a, the variety of substances that can be measured and the variety of specific assays that different labs can use. The only three tests which are commonly checked are TSH, free T4, and to a lesser extent, free T3. We typically only order T3 when we are specifically concerned about hyperthyroidism because it will be more sensitive. Based on our current understanding of thyroid disease and current lab technology, TSH, free T4, plus or minus free T3, are more or less the only choices within the domain of thyroid function tests that you will ever need to order or interpret unless you become an endocrinologist, in which case there are a few more that may come up from time to time. Some of these other tests, which are uh, sometimes commercially available for clinical purposes and sometimes used only for research, uh, include the following. Total T4 and T3, and something called the T3 resin uptake. Together, these tests could be used to estimate free T4 and free T3 via a calculation called the free T4, T3 index. Luckily, with the relatively recent wide availability of free T4 and T3 tests, these others are no longer necessary. Another rarely ordered test is the reverse T3. It was once in vogue as a means to distinguish true thyroid disease from TFT abnormalities caused by non-thyroidal illness. Although physiologically this use seems to make sense, its usefulness has not panned out and it's now phenomenally rare for a conventional doctor to check one. Having said that, reverse T3 has become very popular among doctors and other providers working more on the fringes of medicine where they often market it as the critical hormone your own doctor won't tell you about. As if endocrinologists somehow make more money by intentionally not diagnosing thyroid disease. Next is TRH. I honestly don't know if the fact it's so rarely ordered is because it's not available, not validated for clinical use, generally not helpful, or all three. There's also thyroxine binding globulin, which I've never seen ordered on a patient. And last is thyroid globulin, which actually has a very important though uncommon role in following differentiated thyroid cancer. Since thyroid globulin is only produced by thyroid follicular cells, having detectable levels in the serum is indicative of residual thyroid tissue being present. Thus, if a patient has had the thyroid gland removed entirely as part of the treatment of thyroid cancer, but still has detectable thyroid globulin, it is suggestive of recurrent or metastatic disease. So if TSH, free T4, and free T3 are the only tests which are typically used to diagnose thyroid pathology, and free T4 and T3 typically trend together, it should be pretty easy to interpret TFTs. Well, here's a basic summary. The most common scenario is for TSH to be high and thyroid hormones to be low. That occurs in primary hypothyroidism, meaning there is something wrong with the thyroid gland itself. If the gland is diseased and not producing the hormone, there's less negative feedback on the hypothalamus and pituitary, leading to the secondary increase in TSH. A less common combination is a low TSH and high hormones, as seen with primary hyperthyroidism, including the situation of excess exogenous thyroid replacement. Much, much rarer combinations include low TSH and low free T4 and T3, which is referred to as central hypothyroidism, in which the problem may be in the pituitary or theoretically the hypothalamus. And last is something called secondary hyperthyroidism, in which there is a TSH producing tumor somewhere. So interpretation of TFTs doesn't seem so bad, does it? Four combinations, four general diagnostic categories. Unfortunately, in a significant minority of patients, 
it can be substantially more challenging on account of the effect of non-thyroidal conditions on TFTs. TFTs can be affected by non-thyroidal conditions for a variety of reasons. There could be transient acquired pituitary dysfunction and critical illness, an alteration in the level of thyroid bonding globulin, an increase in circulating free fatty acids which displace thyroid hormone from thyroxine binding globulin, decreased peripheral conversion of T4 to T3, and an altered ratio of T3 to RT3. The net consequence of these potential effects may be some combination of low TSH, either low or high free T4, low free T3, and high RT3. The abnormal TFTs due to non-thyroidal illness is often referred to as either euthyroid sick syndrome or sick euthyroid syndrome. Common causes of euthyroid sick syndrome include pregnancy, any clinical illness, liver disease, renal disease, malnutrition, and various medications. Let's relook at how to interpret TFTs keeping in mind euthyroid sick syndrome as well as a few other diagnoses. And this time let's have a column and row for a normal TSH and normal thyroid hormones. First the obvious. Now the most common scenario other than everything being normal is still high TSH and low T4 plus minus T3 which is consistent with just primary hypothyroidism. There isn't really anything else that commonly causes that pattern. In the event that TSH is low and T4 and T3 are high, that's still consistent with primary hyperthyroidism, but it's also consistent with euthyroid 6 syndrome, particularly if the free T4 is high but free T3 is low. If everything is low, it can be due to either central hypothyroidism as before, as well as euthyroid 6 syndrome. If everything is high, it can still be due to secondary hyperthyroidism from a TSH producing tumor. It can also be due to a very rare inherited disorder of thyroid hormone transport or hormone metabolism. Now if the thyroid hormones are normal but TSH is not, we have a category of thyroid disease called subclinical hyperthyroidism or subclinical hypothyroidism. I'm not a huge fan of the terms since usually subclinical means without symptoms, but in this case the diagnosis is essentially based just on lab tests. I suppose the patient is presumably not symptomatic if thyroid hormone is in the normal range, since that's the final mediator of thyroid function, but the term still feels a little misused to me. In addition, a low TSH with normal T4 and T3 can also be from euthyroid 6 syndrome. A high TSH with normal T4 and T3 can occur during the recovery phase of euthyroid 6 syndrome. A normal TSH with low T4 and T3 can be from euthyroid 6 syndrome and a normal TSH with high T4 and T3 is sometimes seen in acute psychiatric illness. And various drugs, most notably amiodarone, can cause almost any pattern of TFT abnormalities. So as you can see, interpretation of TFTs can become far more complicated if a patient's results don't fall neatly into one of the four classic patterns previously shown. When it comes to ordering TFTs, the selection of tests is very straightforward. Remember, unless you are testing for something highly unusual, only worry about TSH, free T4, and free T3. If you have a low suspicion for thyroid disease and the patient is acutely ill, consider deferring TFTs until the patient's better. It can be very difficult to sort out euthyroid 6 syndrome from true thyroid pathology in acutely ill patients. If the patient is not acutely ill, check the TSH by itself first. If it's normal, consider yourself done with no further testing. If it's high, check a free T4 to distinguish hypothyroidism from subclinical hypothyroidism. If it's low, check a free T4 and free T3. If the free T3 is elevated, it's consistent with hyperthyroidism. If it's normal, the patient likely has subclinical hyperthyroidism. If there is high suspicion for hypothyroidism, check a TSH and free T4. And if there is a high suspicion for hyperthyroidism, check a TSH, free T4, and free T3.
You could ask, if we always check a T3 when hyperthyroidism is suspected, why in the world do we bother with a T4 at all? That's a good question. Uh, I don't really have a good answer for it. I don't think I've ever seen a T3 ordered without a T4, but I'm not positive a T4 is actually always necessary. I'm going to end the video with a discussion of three more tests, which aren't technically thyroid function tests, though they are logically included with this topic. These are the anti-thyroid antibodies. The first two of these antibodies are anti-thyroglobulin antibody and anti-thyroid peroxidase antibody. Thyroid peroxidase is an enzyme involved in the synthesis of thyroid hormone. At least one of these is seen in almost all cases of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, the most common etiology of hypothyroidism. The last category of antibody is anti-TSH receptor antibody, of which there are three subtypes, stimulating, blocking, or neutral. Graves' disease, a common cause of hyperthyroidism, is due to stimulating anti-TSH receptor antibody, while various anti-TSH receptor antibodies can be seen in different stages of Hashimoto's. Measurement of these antibodies is not always needed for making the associated diagnosis if the history and exam strongly favor a particular diagnosis already. However, if the history or exam is inconsistent with a common etiology of either hypo or hyperthyroidism, or if there is concern about confounding euthyroid 6 syndrome in a critically ill patient with symptoms or signs consistent with thyroid disease, checking antibodies can be helpful. That concludes this video on thyroid function tests and their interpretation. If you found it interesting or useful, please remember to like and share it.